screen. Community Matters. Uh, we're here with John Fink. And, and um, this, we're going to talk about media because he's a retired TV executive, but he's also a super duper media consultant person. Yeah. And uh, we did an OC16 show where he appeared at the Harvard Club. Must be what, year, year Two and a half ago. ago? Two years ago. It was just fabulous. And you can find that on OC16, it's there. Uh, or you can find it on our website, right. techhawaii.com. So John sent me a, um, you know, a resume. Uh, I know I, I've said this to you before. And uh, the, the problem with it was, uh, was you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that I, that I you know, ran out of ink in my printer. <laughs> but I will tell you that my eyesight's not that good. And I, I couldn't get through all the entries on it. Now, he says it's not a resume, it's just no, a list. it's listing. just a list of stuff I've done because I wanted to keep track for myself, and I've never done a resume before. So I thought, well, if you want to know what I've done or do, here's, here's what's going on. That's but, it. Well, I knew that you'd been in television and media for right. basically a lifetime, but uh, I didn't know about all the community uh, service you'd done, and that's really extraordinary. Thank you. I mean, uh, you have an enormous number of these community service situations. And I, I thought I knew people who had a lot of community service, but you, you know, you know, with the bell, you hit the thing and it goes right, <laughs> and you're right up there. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's I, educational and it, it feeds into this whole sophistication thing about understanding the community, really understanding the roots of the community. Right. And uh, so my question to you is, uh, is the media doing its job in Hawaii? Ne? Uh, is the media educating people, making them good citizens, making them good voters? Uh, encouraging them to vote, encouraging them to, to engage with government and each other to create, you know, the ideal um, democratic society. Well, the first thing I would remind you is oftentimes the media is the conduit. So all the media can do is present what we've got. So if you don't like the politicians we have, we can't, we in media don't control that. All we can do is present them to you. And if you're disappointed, change who you vote for. Now, then you could say, well, we don't have great candidates sometimes. Absolutely. It's difficult to find quality candidates, and we do tend to recycle people, some of whom are very good and some of whom are maybe not so good. But I, I don't think the media does a good or a bad job on that end. I think the media just shows you here's what's out there. And frankly, uh, over the last few years with more and more media sites putting more of these smaller races on there and more information, I think now as a consumer you have less excuse than ever before for going into a voting situation and being ignorant of what these people believe in, where you might go in and go, oh, I've heard of that guy before and vote for him. Now you should have at least a track record of what either they say they're gonna do or they've done or their positions on things. So I think it, there is a better chance to have a more educated voter nowadays than possibly ever before. But the media calls the shots, doesn't it, in terms of what it presents. I mean, for example, I mean, I was on one of these media advisory councils. We right. might have met at one of these, and uh, my my whole view and concern and remains today is uh, you know weather, sports, automobile accidents, crime. What did I miss? Um, um, you know what? If I ask the general public, which is whom we cater to to a large degree, yeah. what are the things that matter most to you? You'd be amazed that even in this place that everybody yeah. always says, "Oh, come on, it's always sunny and eighty degrees," weather always comes up number two or number three. So uh, why I've would you that. why would you not appease your constituent base? by giving them the information. And we obviously have microclimates here and it's different on the windward side than it is on the leeward side and we're a very outdoor society. So I think there's an argument to be made that that is important for a lot of people. Now, is it as fundamental as homelessness or education? Of course not. But again, the media is not the ones that are responsible for those things. And yet they are responsible for making sure we're aware of them and I think holding people accountable to make sure they deal with those things Absolutely. and try to make it better for everyone, which is, I, I believe, what politicians are supposed to be doing. Well, speaking of politicians, there are a number of politicians who want, including in Washington, we'll get to that, uh, who want to be on the screen. Um, they want to they be seen. Um, they don't really care. You just spell my name right. Uh, and uh, they, they, uh, they will do anything to get on the screen, including right. lie. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a big problem in this country right now. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I wonder if the media ever says, wait a minute, he's, he's lying. Uh, I wonder if the media says, we're not going to cover him because we know he is manipulating us. Yeah. Um, uh, and, let, me just, let me just be clear. There is more media and more, uh, there are more conduits, Jay, than there have ever been before. But do not think this crappy, lying politician thing 
is a new phenomenon. <laughs> um, I went back uh, under the heading of fake news and found out that Ramses the Great spread lies about war victories in 1200 BC. Octavian ran a misinformation campaign about Mark Antony, and the list goes on and on. <laughs> so I would just tell you that it was a little bit more difficult to get it out there before, but as long as people have their personal interests and are truly only interested, which many of them are, in power and control, lying has gone on for a long time. Yeah. The problem is the media and the way we are set up, certainly on uh, news stations and stuff, we have 30-minute pukas to fill, and we are going to present what we get. I mean, there's a vetting process that goes on, but we're not the ones doing the talking for the most part. It's these are the people that you elected. These are the people, and if you believe what they're telling you, then hold them accountable. If you don't believe it, then kick them out, because that's the way the system works. So right now, at the top of Mauna Kea, we have 100, maybe 200 people. I don't know how many there right now, because presumably some of them were carted away already. And they're there, you know, they're there to be on the media. They're, they're protesting to make a statement. And, you know, my own conclusion is if the media, the cameras were not there, they wouldn't be there. Yeah, I, Nothing I, for them to do. I, I don't agree. I think there are people who deeply, deeply believe in this. And I think it goes far beyond just this specific telescope. Okay. I think this is a pent up, you've been doing things like this to us, w whether they're right or wrong. You've been doing this for years. You've, you've taken this mountain and made it your own. Um, and, and we've had enough because this is the biggest and the best. And it's just, you know, you've, you've, you've pushed us one time too many. So I don't, I don't know how many people it really is. You know, you read the surveys that say 75 to 78% of people um, agree with the TMT, including Hawaiians. Um, I, I don't know where that number is actually at, but I do believe people sincerely think that they need a voice to be heard, and they're adamant that they just don't want to see this thing happen. True. However, we've been hearing it for, I want to say, 10 or 15 years. Right. And it went through incredible process. I right. mean, we, we bent over, we meaning the whole state, uh, bent over backward every, uh, every opportunity we, we gave. Right. Um, and finally, it finished. It was finished as final as it could be. And then we had more protests. Right. So what you say is it's finished, but it's not finished in the minds of people who think it's not finished. And if you think it's finished and done, talk to me about Roe versus Wade and what's going on with abortion, <laughs> because that was finished also. And talk to me about gerrymandering and equal rights for people and things like that. All these things are written, many of them as law. It does not mean people's impressions or feelings change, and that's what you're dealing with now. It's like it's, we're really talking about the rule of law. So, okay, if I'm a protester, whether it's uh, Roe v. Wade, whether it's uh, TMT, right. um, what about the other side of the coin? What about the guys who would like to see things stay as they are, and they really have had enough protest? Uh, they, they, they feel that, you know, uh, that the, the side that is in the press has already made its point in court and lost, maybe. Um, and now uh, we, we, have, you know, we have the ordinary citizen who says, you know, I can't trust government. It turns around. It goes upside down. Every time you look, something I took for granted has been flip-flopped on me. Um, and therefore, in this democracy, I no longer can be confident. I no longer can feel that I am the government and the government is me. I think you have to go back to the very, I mean, if we're going to talk about the rule of law, which is what you're basing this premise on, I think you have to go back to the fact that the Constitution has always been a living, breathing document. It is not written in black and white, even though it is, of course, written in black and white, but it's not in black and white, and it's been up for interpretation for 230 years, or we wouldn't have a Supreme Court. We wouldn't have reversals on things. We wouldn't have new things that come into play. Look, everybody talks about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I understand the context in which that was written, and I think even the people who don't want to agree with some of it understand the context. But before that amendment, there's one called the First Amendment, which was the right to free speech. Well, I got to tell you, on television, we can't do what they do in broadcast TV on HBO. We can't swear. We can't show nudity. We can't show graphic violence. So if there's free speech, why can't we do that? Oh, because we're licensed by the very same government that told us that we have the right to free speech. <laughs> so we have all kinds of a mishmash of, of m disconnect going on, but it goes back to this living, breathing document. 
And I think you have to look at that when you talk about these things that what appears to be black and white is never black and white. And any time you have a civil society, and hopefully things stay civil with the TMT, you're going to have dissenters. And uh, I, I won't go into the details, but there are a couple of issues locally which have driven me crazy over the years. One of them is the, um, the natatorium, which is supposed to be a wonderful reflection of the wonderful men and women from this state when it was a territory that fought in World War I, and it's an embarrassment. And every year it gets pushed down the road. And then you have the stairway to heaven, which is inviting someone to finally die before they say, close it or fix it. <laughs> We just continue to push these things down the road. And what I've tried to make clear when I've had the audience of anybody who's involved in making those decisions is, look, nobody ever wins 10 to nothing. It's going to be 6 to 4 or 7 to 3, but you've got to do what the right thing is, and people will be upset, but you need to make decisions because by not making decisions on these things, you actually are making decisions. Well, let me ask you this. But, you know, the title of our show is How Has the Media Changed? And yes. that means during your career. Right. Um, and mine, as an observer, I'm not, not directly involved. Most of my time is not in the media. Right. Um, and how is it changing now? Because I think it has changed dramatically. It has changed perhaps not for the best. And right now, it's, you can't be too optimistic, actually. Well, the first thing I would tell you is as far as content goes, and at the end of the day, forget, it doesn't matter if I get it on my phone, my iPad, you know, in an in a, in a, in a airport lobby, the content is king. And the, he, who, he or she who creates the best content in the viewer's minds, they win. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, it has changed quite a bit. I've been doing this over 40 years, but it has changed quite a bit in the fact that back in the day, you had ABC, CBS, and NBC. You had a public broadcast station. You might have an ethnic station and maybe an independent. That was your TV landscape. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, you started getting real energy coming out of the fledgling cable world with CNN and ESPN and TBS and TNT. And there were probably a half dozen. And NPR on radio, absolutely. So you started getting some of that. Now, the average American consumer gets over 200 channels and watches 12. That's what the research says. So, paying too much. And is paying way too much. <laughs> I absolutely agree. My analogy of what goes on in the world of um, cable and satellite as a broadcaster, if I went into a supermarket and got my shopping cart, and as I started walking and someone threw a bunch of items in, and I'd say, I don't, I don't want those items. And you'd say, oh, no, if you shop here, you have to buy those items. <laughs> That's what you get with cable and with satellite. <laughs> so there have been years and years of protest about a la carte selection and stuff, and the cry was, oh no, if you do that, the smaller stations will go out of business. Well, I kind of thought that's what we call America. It's called, people don't want it. If we don't want something in a capitalist society, it ceases to exist. It happens every week with restaurants and a lot of other things. We evolve to a better quality that way. So the one thing I would tell you is I think content is king. I think it's hard to aggregate content like we used to on three or four stations, where all the good writers and actors were on the major network stations. They're all over the place now, and frankly, they're going onto the internet and onto uh, pay services because they have much more freedom in what they can say and what they can show and how they can deal with issues that you just can't do on broadcast TV. Makes it much tougher nowadays than it did 30 years ago for TV. broadcast TV. At the end of the day, though, broadcast TV, for the most part, still aggregates the greatest number of viewers, especially for significant events, the Super Bowl, the Academy Awards, uh, the Merry Monarch Festival. Um, that's where the most people will be, and that's what the advertisers want, is to reach as many people as possible with their message. Sure. But broadcast TV, is broadcast TV doing the job? You know, for example, we talk about weather and sports and crime and accidents. Right. Um, that may be what people say they want. Right. But what do people really need? Because their education usually stops in high school or college. Yeah. And after I, that time, they're educated by broadcast TV. I, Are we sufficiently educating them? Um, you know, sufficiently educating, you might end up with a situation like school where people don't go to class and don't care. And that may be the problem with trying to be the educators. Now, I will say, I think locally, and I'm going to put on my subjective hat, I think Hawaii News Now has done a phenomenal job with issues like the, the police chief and the homeless situation and uh, its coverage of what's going on with the TMT right now and trying to remain straddled in the middle 
to present the information to you and then you, the local viewer, the local citizen can decide which way you think things should go. I think it is done much better on the local level by local news sources than on the national level and especially the cable level. It is not news anymore. It's, it's right. pandering to an audience to try to generate eyeballs for that. advertising. Yeah. So it's a completely different thing. As long as you still have local stations that are accountable in their communities, that have people who can get fired if they bring up fake news or false news and stuff, I think you can still say, if I need to know what's going on locally, I can still get it. And hopefully, for the most part, I get it through local television, local radio, which doesn't, which doesn't have a lot of news people, and local newspapers. And the big question in our world today now, Jay, is what happens as more and more small town newspapers, which was often the only source of news, they're not covered by the big TV stations in the major markets, but the, the Lihue newspaper, the, the Molokai Times, or whatever you may call it in North Dakota, and places like that, when they go out of business, who's keeping an eye on government? Who's keeping an eye to make sure the people in power are doing what they're supposed to do on the benefit for the benefit of the people, and the answer is no one. Why not? Why not social media? Why can't social media get right into that? Can you trust social media? So far, not so much. Yeah, well, that's a question. Can we make social media a better media? Can, can you make it can better? Do? Yes. Can, can, can you Washington can you cure it? Should no. Washington do it? No. No. Can you make social media a better medium? Absolutely. Should people spend less time on social media? Absolutely. Are we losing our ability to communicate as human beings? Absolutely. Go talk to any psychologist or psychiatrist. Used to be you and I would get done with a movie. When the movie ended, I would turn to you and say, Jay, what'd you think? What does everybody in a movie theater do now? They reach for their phone. Because God forbid it's been 90 to 120 minutes, they haven't been able to communicate, and they might have missed the latest cats walking on the piano keys. Cats on the piano keys. Well, you know, Sorry. the problem, problem is that social media is irresponsible. There's no way to, to take a, a sort of spurious, uh, I don't want to say journalist, but a spurious news purveyors right. uh, and make them responsible. I mean, if we could figure out how to do that, that would be helpful. I don't know if you can do it in a, in a, in a pure sense because then you would be denying free speech. So people wanting to lie and doing that through uh, print or radio or TV, that's been going on forever. People lie to each other every day. You can't stop that. So to suggest you can do that empirically and not be accused of playing Big Brother in social media is going to be very difficult. And I know Google and Facebook have AI, artificial intelligence, and, and actual human beings who are looking through stuff to vet it. But how far do they go before someone calls them for going too far by saying, well, it's not all true, but some of it's true, so why are you taking that down? Is that because you don't like that position that you're being shown? So I think we have to be careful, and I would agree with you there are people um, who don't necessarily want to know the truth. They want to know what makes them oh, let's talk feel about justified. That, that happens or, on a national. Well, it happens everywhere. Well, I, it? I, I have a real problem with it on a national level. I'll tell you what's feeding it is the 24-7 news service world and information world. Things are, you know, it used to be Andy Warhol's famous line about everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes. Yeah, right. Now it's 15 seconds. <laughs> because yesterday's Twitter tweet is... I don't even remember who you're talking about in, because that's how insignificant it is. But when you're feeding the beast, I, uh, the analogy I would use is you have a barbecue at your house, but you don't know how many people are going to show up or what they want, but you have to keep putting coal into it to keep the fires ready in case people come in. That's what happens with 24-7 news services. And local news has now got to take its reporters and hire additional digital-only people because it's not just 5, 6, 9, and 10 that we watch the news. I want to know when something's going on at 2 o'clock. And, 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 and from a business standpoint, if you spend enough time on my website, you may not watch the 5 or 6 o'clock news. And now I've lost a potential viewer, which affects my ability to sell advertising. So my concern is, where are we going to be in 5 or 10 years? I can assure you that the internet revenue as it is laid out now for media companies in no way comes close to equalizing what they used to or still get from their major baby, which is the day-to-day -day print paper and the day-to-day -day newscast. You know, a, 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 an undercurrent of this is the economic. Yes. It's driven. I mean, the most responsible news organizations are driven by the economics, and the economics aren't so good. I mean, uh, you know, we've lost a number of uh, 
number of newspapers, not only little ones in little towns, no, big but ones. big ones in big towns. Major towns used to have two or three newspapers have one. Yeah, and so uh, then you have to go to other places. And you know, I get my news from the, the Times, the Post, and the Guardian, I mean, and others too, but those, those right. three, and I'm saying to myself, it's kind of a consolidation of information. Because where else do I go? And where else does other people go? They, the, you know, the other papers take it from the Associated Press, they take it from the Times right. and the Post and all that. Right. And so what's happening is, uh, you know, you, you actually are relying for original news on a smaller number of publications. Well, and, and how about this? By two o'clock in the afternoon or after lunch, when most of the mainland's gone to bed, you go back to one of our local websites and you're looking for national news and stuff, and it's the same thing you saw a couple yes. hours ago, and now you're, you're upset. Like, why yes. haven't you told... Can you imagine that? It used to be you'd get a morning paper, which was yesterday's news, and then you'd watch a morning news and you had to wait till five o'clock to find out what the hell was going on. Now, if I don't get it and it's not changed every 20 or 30 minutes, I feel like they're not providing me with what I should be getting. This is scary. It is scary because it's, inhuma it's, inhuma it's not humanly possible to keep providing enough news. And if I really wanted to do it, I would start providing you news from places you probably don't care about, but I could provide you new stories about things going on in Europe or in Asia or in Africa. And the, the taste for that for most viewers is not substantial enough to say, I don't, I don't want to read about that stuff. So where is this all going? It doesn't sound like it's going a good place. Because, yes, I am disappointed when I look at the New York Times late in the afternoon and I see the same thing as I, I saw in the morning. I right. want it now. I want to know the... And if I see it some other place and not the New York Times, then I say, hmm, they're ahead of the New York Times. Why does the New York Times pick this up? Uh, so, you know, I think what, what's happening is, yes, feed them more, feed them more, but, but there's got to be a solution, well, an here, economic one. Here's part of what you're getting at, and you're kind of a worldly guy, but if you're checking out BBC, where it's already 8 a.m., and they're giving you an update on Brexit, and it's midnight, or, and, and most of the New York Times staff has gone home for the day, you may get it from another source, because, again, f from just the economics of the bodies required to keep feeding the coal into the beast all day and all night, it's very difficult. I will tell you, when we had the famous snafu with the um, Twitter alert about the North Korean missiles coming in, that was Saturday morning at 8.30. That is not a great time for any media <laughs> company to have all hands on deck. It's a Saturday, you're short-staffed to begin with, it's 8 a.m., there's nothing really happening up until the six o'clock or five o'clock news, uh, I give the media a lot of credit for being the first ones to break that story before the government did, because people ran in on their day off and said, we got to cover this. So I do think those people are there. I think they will always be there. I think they're passionate about what they do, and they want to be good neighbors and good citizens and do their job well. I still see a lot of hope for that. But this idea of feeding the beast 24 hours with who said what about whom on Twitter and who, who made a comment about something or who's dating someone and putting that at the top of a news feed, we're, we're reaching the lowest common denominator. We are, and, and we're, not, we're losing precious time in becoming educated about civic matters. He has just a short thing about the, about the, uh, the incoming missiles issue. Yeah. Uh, um, I Googled it immediately after I heard. I wanted to see what was on. And believe it or not, John, it's unbelievable. There was a newspaper or website in Britain that had it. This is like 10 minutes after it started. Yeah. It's just a totally global community about yeah. this. But you know, one thing I wanted to post to you, uh, you know, looking, searching for the future on this, searching yeah. for where it might go. Right. It seems to me that to feed them all, um, to get it all together, the secret is aggregation. It's sort of a, an overlayer of somebody who aggregates all the news that's out there, somebody credible, uh, and, and tells you what other people are printing. Well, uh, I would tell you that credible, unfortunately, has become a subjective term in this day and age, which is not good. But the other thing is, I'm not sure that the average consumer has the interest nor the time to go through this huge aggregation you're talking about and disseminate what is important and what's not important. And if you give me overkill, if you give me too much information, the brain shuts down and now I'm, I'm just not going to play, I'm not interested. So I think what you've got now is this kind of sordid, um, mixture of news that probably educates, titillation stuff about celebrities and things like that, and then you cherry pick which ones you want to click on and go to. And I think that's the model that we're seeing right now uh, on most credible news sites. 
Uh, I'm not sure it provides all the answers, but Jay, I got to tell you, there's a large portion of the public that just is not as interested as, as you'd like them to be. And, and, and I think we see that in things that don't get done and don't get resolved. And I'll tell you what, if a politician felt that my job depends on it, I got people screaming at me to get this thing done, it would get done. Sure. Or else they lose their job. Sure. So I think what we need to do from a civic standpoint is be more involved on that end to make sure that these issues are taken care of. And there's obviously a, higher, a hierarchy of what issues need to be dealt with first. The pothole in your neighborhood is probably not as vital as Ward Avenue or Nimitz Highway. I mean, you can only have so much money to play with. I understand I that. I would trust an aggregator to do that. Well, I mean, don't give me don't give me the uh, small stuff. I want to know the major stuff, and I'm going to trust you to list the uh, you know the aggregated stories. You're going to trust them until you come up to one or two days in a row where they don't give you what you wanted, and you yeah, found right, it out right, somewhere right. else in England, <laughs> and you said, "Why the heck did my guy tell me that stuff?" You know, you said before that um, you know the public likes to listen to what it already what it already believes. Right. Uh, so, so the base, the base will, you know, listen to anything that Donald Trump and his friends will say, uh, and, and, and knowing that a rational person would never accept that, but they do, they do. Um, and, you know, I see this as a huge undermining of the First Amendment. I see it as a huge undermining of, I, I see the public is not willing to analyze, not willing to use critical thinking not willing to become mm, responsible news consumers. Right. And, and you'll have to agree with me that in the past, what, five, 10 years, this has really gotten much worse. Well, I think the 24-7 news cycle has, has ramped it up. But I would suggest to you that the First Amendment and free speech means anybody can say what they want. And as a, as a human, I'm able to choose what I want to believe and not believe. And I do believe that when it comes to the way the political system works right now, I think as many people ignore one side, but they'll tolerate it because they are so against the other side. So I don't think you've got necessarily strong beliefs in certain things that one side says or the other. They just don't want to listen to the other side. And uh, Daddy told me a long time ago, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. And I think <laughs> now sometimes people would just prefer not to hear the facts or uh, there's a great song that, uh, uh, by a group called Drive-By Truckers called What It Means. And in the song it says, we love scientific facts as long as they tell us what we want to hear. And it's, it's not exactly worded that way, but it's, it's, it's a simple line, but it's true. People, if they hear something they don't want to hear, when you hear a food is not good for you, but you like it, you go, ah, the heck with it, I'm going to eat it anyway, or whatever. So, uh, you know, even getting the information out there, doesn't mean everyone's going to do what, what you might perceive to be the smart thing to do or the logical thing to do. Yeah. So, a last, a last thing, John. Sure. Advice to the news consumer. Advice to the information consumer. How does he conduct himself in a world where alternative facts are everywhere, where people do not value truth or they can't even define truth? Um, because we have to Ultimately, we are the government. The government is us. Mm. We have to be engaged. If we're not engaged, terrible, draconian things will happen to our society. I, I think How people, do we conduct I ourselves? think people feel rather estranged from the government, actually, which is unfortunate. But it's a byproduct of where things have gone and, and uh, maybe a lack of candidates sometimes. But I would say that for my dollar, I would still say uh, I, I'm relatively comfortable with what local media has to offer because I do know that there are paid professionals who are doing a job with other paid professionals watching their back to make sure they are reporting fair and someone who's even above them and above them. And if it doesn't happen and there's enough scuttlebutt and if enough uh, consumers are upset about something and someone's not doing a good job, they will be fired. In, in national cable, they're often promoted. So, <laughs> so it's a different, so if you wanna know where I think the best way to get it now, that isn't going to solve your problem if you've got a, a, a real need to know what's going on, certainly with deeper issues in, in the Sudan and in, with Brexit and things like that. You know, uh, a lot of people, I've seen surveys that say one of the most down the middle presenting the facts, you make your own decisions, is the BBC. So for people who really want to know about other things than what's going on locally, BBC International might be a place to go. Uh, Reuters and AP do a pretty good job of just saying, here's what actually happened. And you don't get, at least I don't think, you don't get a lot of editorializing. And if that's what you want to avoid, because you really do want to know what's going on. But again, I would tell you, I'm not sure a lot of people still care about that anymore. They just want to feel right. 
and they want to feel that their guy or their gal is there, and sometimes the facts or reality be damned. And um, that's a problem. Yeah. But it, it, it's as much a problem with the consumer as it is with the, the people feeding it to them. Look, they don't feed it if there's not an audience for it. Sure. Shows get canceled all the time because not enough people watch it. It's a pretty simple premise. That would be the same thing with news. One thought comes to me from what you said just now is that you, you, need, you need an audience. Uh, you need your own audience. You right. need an audience to bounce off your own thinking. Uh, and it's not somebody who agrees with you about everything either. Absolutely. It's somebody like you, know, you and me here together like this, having a conversation. It's bouncing it off your friends. It's, it's getting out of the, you know, your, your sofa. <laughs> well, and it, you know, it used to be people could disagree and they were still friends. That's, I'm, I'm hearing more and more about people who won't bring subjects up with their friends or their family. We can't even have a civil discussion. And that's, that's a danger to me. That, that's, you know, that's civil war type mentality of not being able to discuss stuff. But I, I, I think that you have to um, ask yourself, okay, well, let's step back from news for a minute. How many people who go to church on Sunday go to a different church to hear what they're talking about? How many people who love Japanese food and go and eat Japanese food all the time go and eat Italian food? I'm not sure that this, that, I mean, it, I'm, I'm, this is a little simplistic, but how much different is it? We like what we like. We, we go where it's agreeable to us. We feel good. And we don't sometimes want to venture out. And yeah. I think, I think my, my, my worldview on that would be life's too short. You really should give yourself a little opportunity to see what's out there. You know, people talk about um, in Hawaii how sometimes it's great for a kid who's grown up here to go to the mainland for college and if they want to come back. And if they don't, they don't get to know anymore. I got to tell you, uh, I had friends who grew up where I grew up three hours north of Chicago or an hour north of Chicago, went to the University of Illinois three hours south of Chicago, and they work in Chicago. Their life has been no different than what we think of as our. Um, um, What's the word? Uh, not, eh. Our small island Our community. Our small island community that doesn't get a parochial sense that what we do and we stay here. I, 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 you know, people used to say, do you ever get rock fever in Hawaii? And I'd say, you know what? We never used to drive to Milwaukee or Gary, Indiana right. to get away. Right. You do what you do. And Everybody it, lives in his own small their town. Their own small little <laughs> silo. Yeah. So I think one of the problems when people talk about not educating and stuff, well, these are the same people who have a specific religious belief and won't venture outside of that. And there are a lot of happy and healthy people who have other beliefs. Do you ever wonder what they're thinking or talking yeah. about? And yeah. if the answer is no, I don't care, that's no different than what you're talking about with news. It's a great rhetorical question, but I want to, I want to close the show by telling me whatever we've discussed today, and however open-minded we may want to be, I am not going to watch Fox News. Okay. I'm sorry. That's your call, but you know what? <laughs> You ought to know what it's about. I had a friend years ago who told me he wouldn't watch The Simpsons. And I said, why? It's really? irreverent. It's, he said, because they do some uh, sarcastic stuff. I said, well, what are you talking? He said, well, my kids watch it. I said, maybe you should watch The Simpsons to know what your kids are talking about. You don't have to like it, but at least you'll have an idea what's going on. Okay, okay. I'll watch Fox News. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll think of you, John. I mean, uh, thanks. John thanks a lot. TV executive. All right, Jay. <laughs> Thank you nice so much. Nice to be here. Though. Thank you for having me. Hello.